hello all uh, welcome to the nalcon webinar series my name is harshit i'm part of nalcon team we have been running nalcon security conference since 2010 where cyber security is discussed in detail among the industry government and tech community uh, the pandemic has given us the opportunity to continue to share knowledge and connect with our global community by running lots of online events like webinars workshops training conferences and resume clinics Uh, happy to let you know that we have also launched our annual nalcon international security conference and training uh, in online version uh, it is scheduled from 1st to 6th of march 2021 so do check out more details in the zoom chat window today we have with us neeraj shukla and he is going to share his view on enterprises security architecture uh, is it a time for a booster shot neeraj is assistant vice president of information security at genpac and in his current role he is responsible for the security architecture in a career spanning nearly two decades he has worked on multiple areas within the cyber security domain including network and application security identity and access management penetration testing and others he has been a speaker and panelist at forums including etc so summit and cloud co on behalf of all of us i welcome him to this session uh, before we go ahead few instruction for the audience Our today's talk duration is about thirty minutes, and after that we will have a question answer session. You all can ask your question using chat option uh, of Zoom window. The all questions will be answered by speaker after the talk. And also, I request you to keep your mic mute during the session to avoid any kind of disturbance. So, without any further delay, I request Neeraj to take a charge of the session. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Harshit. Let me share my screen. Uh, hope the screen is visible, Harshit. Thank you. Yes. All right. So let me start first by uh, introducing uh, myself uh, briefly. Uh, so I started my career as a developer, uh, then moved into the uh, networking role, and in a few years I kind of transitioned into an information security role. Uh, so within the information security, I have handled uh, uh, areas such as consulting. Uh, security architecture pen testing application security sock design etc and uh, i started off uh, uh, working in uh, tcs and then i moved to wipro uh, where i kind of service multiple customers globally and in my current role i'm uh, in genpac and i head the security architecture uh, i've also worked on mergers and acquisition security uh, i've looked at uh, or work on network and app compute security So if you see, I kind of have looked at the whole security architecture evolve uh, over a period of time. Now the last point about this, uh, you might be wondering why I have uh, history mentioned in an information security session, but we'll get to that uh, in a minute or so. Uh, let me start by uh, giving brief on the agenda. Uh, so what we'll try to cover today is uh, what are the traditional security architectures. uh with the traditional security architectures what are those challenges and especially if you look at uh, the pandemic situation how has that impacted the whole conventional design uh, of the security architecture uh the next or the final item that we'll cover is we'll look at certain new architectural models that are available and see how it can essentially uh, increase immunity or win build your organization uh, more immune to the new threat vectors right so let's start uh, uh so now i talked about history right uh, but if, if you look at it i was really scared of history when i was a kid uh, i could not i could never memorize uh, the, those dates uh, the names of kings i could never memorize uh, the dynasties etc but i kind of got interested and built and in, uh, built up an interest uh, into the medieval history specifically looking at uh, uh, the the defense uh, strategies uh, especially in the medieval world in europe uh, at that in the medieval times a uh, lot of these uh, european uh, lords or the Uh, knights they used to build the castles uh, to protect uh, themselves and they had a very uh, strong uh, architecture for castles right if you look at it uh, in the initial 10th or 11th uh, century or so 
uh, they started building uh, a Morton Bailey castles. Uh, and what was a Morton Bailey castle? So if you look at the whole design here, right? So there is a mort, which is essentially an earthen mound, uh, which was typically done over a small hill or so. And it would be surrounded by a ditch. Now on top of the mound, which is, there was basically a flattened structure where they would create a keep. Now, what was the keep? The keep was the most important part of the castle. It was the castle's primary defense element where the Lord would stay with his family. So that was what is, was being protected within the whole castle in the structure. Adjacent to the uh, whole uh, mort was a bailey, which was a kind of a flattened uh, uh, yard. And it used to house uh, all those uh, domestic life. It would include the kitchen, it would include uh, stables, it would include workshops and all of that. And the whole bailey and the uh, keep was surrounded by a wooden fence. And this whole, this whole castle structure, including the bailey, was surrounded by a uh, ditch. Now, this was a great defensive structure. Uh, it, it, and there were other advantages to this too. It was very easy uh, to build. It was quick to build. It was cheap to build because you could get local labor. Uh, so the, uh, the invaders who came from north of Europe uh, came into England and other locations and they started building it by leveraging local labor and timber uh, was easy to get. Uh, so it was much easier to build this. However, this one had a big drawback. Uh, the invaders, they used to use flamethrowers and would kind of uh, uh, burn the whole castle down. So this Morton Bailey could not sustain for a long period. That gave way to another castle structure, which was uh, based on stone elements. And within the 12th to 15th uh, century, uh, there was a concept of concentric castle. Now, what was a concentric castle? It was a kind of a layered defense uh, uh, model where you had the whole outer uh, layer of uh, wall, which would protect the inner layer of wall. And within that, that would there would be the, uh, the, the specific uh, houses or specific keeps uh, that would be there within that whole inner wall that would be the uh, uh, element of protection, right? Now, if you look at, the details of this concentric castle, how was that built, right? There was a moat struck, moat uh, at the perimeter. Now, the, what was a moat? A moat was essentially uh, uh, a ditch which had very steep sides. And it typically had, uh, uh, it was filled with water and would be very difficult for attackers to kind of uh, reach the wall uh, and, and attack it. And between the castle and the mainland, there used to be an, a narrow entranceway, uh, which was usually the connecting point uh, between the castle and the mainland, right? And there used to be a drawbridge. Uh, so the drawbridge could be raised if there was an attack and cut off all the access from here. And then there were, as I mentioned, two layers of uh, uh, walls, uh, the outer layer and the inner layer. So usually the inner layer was like higher than the outer, uh, outer layer. And that was because to get a better uh, or higher vantage uh, point so that the archers who were positioned on the inner walls could look at, uh, could have a good view of the attackers and could fire their arrows to those. And even if the invaders were able to uh, get in, break the outer wall and get uh, in towards the uh, inner wall, they would still be under uh, the line of fire of these uh, uh, archers, right? Now, how, if, if that was a castle defense structure, what was the strategy which attackers had and which, did it really succeed? Uh, so if you look at uh, the strategies, there were essentially two strategies which uh, the attackers had. One was to batter the wall with siege engines, right? They would have like arrows, uh, which would be uh, laced with uh, uh, fire. And there would be siege towers, there would be, they would batter the walls, uh, there would trebuchets, basically trebuchets were, this is what trebuchet is. And 
these would be like they would load dead bodies etc on the trebuchets and uh, fling it across the walls uh, within the castle boundary and especially to spread diseases uh, uh, right but most of the time this used to fail so what was the other strategy that they had so what they used to do was they would block all the access to the castle in the hope that someone like within uh, inside people would run out of supplies and then they would be forced to surrender right however a lot of times that also did not work out uh, and the specific reason being because uh, within the castle uh, the people people used to have uh, used to do farming they used to grow their own crops uh, they used to have wells uh, through, from which they could drink uh, water now if i look at the medieval castle structure and i now come back to the uh, security architecture right how do both of these correlate right we looked at the concentric uh, castles and the layered defenses within the concentric castle of a moat outer wall inner wall similarly within the traditional enterprise security design we've seen a, a, a layered defense model right so we typically have a perimeter security uh, which includes physical security which would include your perimeter firewall uh, dmzs etc and then you would have the network security layer which would be the your data center firewall which would include your web proxy wireless security etc then the other layer third layer was the endpoint security uh, which is in, which includes your antivirus edr endpoint dlp and all of those layers the next layer is the application security uh, which covers your static uh, assessments it covers your dynamic assessments it includes uh, web application security it's uh, web application firewalls etc and final layer which was the innermost layer is the data security and that is what your crown jewel is you would have data classifications encryption and all of those controls to protect those crown jewels and across these layers you would see a governance risk and compliance uh, framework uh, and there would be continuous operations security operations and monitoring so this is a layered defense uh, is and how it works now let's look at a typical uh, traditional enterprise architecture diagram uh, all the organizations would typically have this kind of a diagram and i'm kind of covering a hub and spoke model uh, uh, organizations may have certain variations but this is how it would typically look like uh, so if you look at this within the hub location you would typically have an external or a perimeter firewall which is the outermost layer of protection and this would protect all communication towards the internet and towards the inside of the organization there would typically be a dmz zone uh, where internet facing services would be hosted and then there would be another layer of firewall and behind that firewall you would typically have the inside zone right the in within the inside zone you would have a typical uh, uh, server zone which would again be behind a firewall and where the typical all the servers and data would get hosted you would also see a user zone where essentially all the users would sit and when the users have to access all the servers or any of the servers or they have to go out to internet they would typically go through a firewall it could be through this route or it could be through this route uh, generally within an organization you would also have branch offices which would have its own layer of protection uh, with firewalls and the branch offices would get connected back into the hub locations uh, over a mpls connectivity or at times site to site connectivity and all of that protected by a firewall usually any third party data centers would also connect back into your hub locations but that would also be through a, a either an mpls connectivity site to site connectivity or whatever but through a firewall control now let's go back to that whole castle design right uh, so while 
I mentioned that the whole the whole concentric castle was a very formidable castle, right? It it was really really difficult uh, for the invaders to attack those castles and win. Okay. In fact, I could quote uh, an example of like uh, there was a castle of Rhodes, I, I believe in around 14, 1400s, 1480s or something, where a, a size of like three thousand five hundred soldiers were able to protect against nearly 70,000 Ottoman Turks, and they came out victorious. And this whole battle lasted for about uh, two, two and a half months, but uh, the Ottomans could not really uh, invade the castle. But what is it that changed for the castle? And why did uh, the, the number of castles start started decreasing, right? Uh, why, why did people, lots, no more they started building, they, they built any more castles, right? And that was because a new threat vector emerged. And what was that threat vector? It was gunpowder. Now, before gunpowder, it was nearly impossible to break uh, all of these castle walls. So gunpowder was discovered in China. It is attributed to be discovered in China and where it was like first documented around 1100s or so. And that got introduced to Europe in about 1300s. Now, the, what was the vulnerability of these castle walls? They were never designed or to adapt for gunfire or to handle any gunfire or cannon fire. So they were susceptible to it. And when the cannons came into uh, Europe, uh, these castles could no more withstand uh, the cannon fires and would crumble. Uh, so now if I look back into our traditional security architecture, right? So what is it that is changing for our traditional layered defense model? Is there something that has changed over the last uh, few years? Now, especially if I look at the pandemic situation that came in last year, there are two key changes that you can observe. One, most of the uh, organizations are going through a digital transformation. While it start, while the whole digital transformation started much before the pandemic, but it has really picked up pace uh, during the whole pandemic uh, situation. Uh, what is the digital transformation? So you'll see all of the internal servers are now moving or moving to the cloud infrastructure. So there is increased cloud adoption. They're migrating to either infrastructure as a service or what goods are migrating to software as a service. The second biggest change that you see uh, that has happened over the last uh, year is the work from home. Now, all the users who were earlier sitting uh, within your enterprise control boundary, either within here or at branch centers are now all outside on the open internet and connecting to your workloads. See, earlier uh, it used to be like 15, uh, maybe 15, 20% of uh, work from home uh, capacity uh, and mostly 80% of uh, uh, the employees would be working from within the uh, enterprise control boundary. However, that whole equation has now inverted it's almost 80% or more than, more than that, 80 to 90% of employees who are working from outside, from working from home, and around 10 or 20% uh, who are working from within the organization perimeter. What does that mean? So this network trans transformation it, and this whole digital transformation and this whole model of access from these end users to your cloud uh, to your cloud workloads that has completely changed and what it means is it is time to boost the architecture uh, now the traditional defenses if you go back to the previous slide the traditional defenses which was this whole perimeter is no more sufficient you have users who are coming over the internet and are accessing uh, your cloud infrastructure they're accessing workloads, they're accessing applications, but they're not going through that. If you try to make them go through this channel, it's going to increase your bandwidth. Uh, there's going to be load on the bandwidth. There's going to be load on the VPN infrastructure, and it's not an efficient design. 
if the users are going directly, right? So that means there are new threat vectors that are emerging because all the users, all employees are sitting on internet. And also your entire workload is also exposed to the internet, right? So you have to really look at the entire design and see if your traditional uh, that you have to look at uh, when you are designing a security architecture. Your architecture is adaptive. Adapt to the changing uh, reality. It needs to be adaptive uh, to ensure that new threat vectors are appropriately handled. It needs to be resilient and it also needs to be scalable. So what are the key or critical components then you have to look at, right? If you have to make the solution adaptive, resilient, scalable, one of the important things that you have to look at is this whole architecture must be cloud centric and it must be cloud delivered because if you're going to scale up your architecture, it should be delivered from some place where you can easily scale it up. So cloud centricity and cloud delivery is going to be an important aspect. The second aspect is the identity. Now, identity has become the new perimeter, right? And when you talk about the identity, it's not just the user identity that we are referring here. It must also be user identity. It must also be user identity plus device identity. Uh, username authentication, username password authentication, multi-factor authentication, plus the device certificate authentication, all must be considered. And all of this data has to go as a real-time context uh, into uh, the solution or the security architecture that you have. All of that has to be uh, understood in the context of where that uh, connection is coming from and then accordingly take a decision to allow that uh, access or not. Now, I talked about the two uh, transformation aspects. One was the digital transformation, second was the whole network trans transformation where end users are working from uh, internet. To handle all, all of those aspects, you would also need to ensure that you enforce the right set of security controls at the source, which is your endpoint. And especially if you're going to download data, if the employees are going to download data on those endpoints and work on that. Uh, finally, on, on the whole workloads, right? So all the workloads which are going to be hosted on cloud, cloud you have to ensure that there are appropriate cloud control boundaries there. Uh, and uh, there are micro perimeters set up to ensure all access is appropriately controlled. So if you have to do all of that, and if we have to build up the enterprise immunity, what does it require? So there are two suggestions or recommendations that I can give, right? One is the secure access service edge. Uh, now SASE has really picked up uh, in the last uh, a few months. Uh, there's a lot of talk about SASE, uh, and this was an architectural model or a framework defined by Gartner. And the second aspect is zero trust. Now, zero trust is not something which is very new. Uh, it was uh, developed by Forrester nearly a decade ago. But why are these, both SASE and zero trust, which are not new concepts, why are they picking up traction now? It is because the technology to support SASE and Zero Trust is really coming into the market now. Product vendors are creating or building solutions uh, which addresses the Zero Trust as well as the SASE, SASE architecture. And that is being introduced in the market at a rapid pace now. Now, if you have to adopt SASE or Zero Trust, is it like you have to adopt adopt one over the other? The answer is no. In fact, SASE and Zero Trust will coexist. And I'll tell you how. But let's look at what the Zero Trust is. Right? So Zero Trust, the basic principle of Zero Trust is never trust, always verify. And what that means is 
every device, every user access, every network flow, everything has to be proven. You have to trust all of these access which is coming into your workloads as untrusted. And until the device or the user is able to authenticate and let you know that, okay, uh, that they are the trusted entities, you must not allow that access to go through to that workload, to that application, to that data. The second aspect to look at in zero trust, all traffic must be authenticated, which I already covered, and it must be encrypted too. What that means is, at the end, which is your laptops or your uh, endpoints, from that to your location or to your target, the whole traffic needs to be encrypted end to end. The privilege, least privilege, must be enforced. So. If a user requires only read-only access uh, to a specific application, only read-only must be provided for that user. If there is only a segment of, of that application area or of specific data that the user needs access to, access to only that specific segment or data has to be provided. So that least privilege must be maintained. All data flows must be controlled. So visibility and control is critical. So all of the requests which are coming to your workloads, to your applications, to your data must be known to you within that architecture. So that architecture must ensure that there is complete visibility into all of that uh, traffic flow that is coming in. Now, if you do all of the above, does it mean you are meeting the zero trust requirements? No, not really. That's only the first part. What zero trust says is you have to continuously reevaluate that trust, right? So once you've established those trust, you continue to do the reevaluation of that. So as an example, if a user was accessing uh, that data uh, from an IP address based in India, and suddenly within 30 minutes, uh, that access has changed and is showing a source IP from a very different uh, uh, region, or maybe from a very different country itself. Is it feasible for that user to move from this location to that within that 30 minutes or within that one or two hour period? If not, then uh, this the, the, the new traffic which is coming in is no more trusted. That has to be blocked or you have to step up that authentication for that user. So this continuous reevaluation is a must, right? And all traffic must be logged and inspected. So that is also critical. Uh, let me come to the SASE. So what is really a SASE? Now SASE, in a sense, is a convergence of two aspects. One is the networking, and second is the security. Both of it clubbed together and bundled as a one architectural model. On the networking side, you would have like all of the networking components such as SD-WAN, uh, you would control routing, you would have app optimization, you would have bandwidth aggregation, all of those aspects, right? And on the right, which is the security aspects or the security components of the SASE, that would include your zero trust. So as I mentioned earlier, so SASE and zero trust are not exclusive. You can have zero trust as part of SASE. So zero trust components, Firewall as a service, uh, CASP, which is Cloud Access Security Broker, your secure web gateways, which is your proxy uh, infrastructure, DNS, uh, your remote access, all of that into a single platform, right? And how would that whole architecture look like? So this is what a typical SASE architecture would look like. So here you would have the service edge, the service edge is essentially the edge where all the branch and the remote users would connect to. So all of the user traffic would essentially hit the service edge. And how would that connectivity be established? It would either be through IPsec tunnel uh, for a branch, uh, it could be an IPsec VPN or SSL VPN uh, for a remote user. Uh, and all of these SASE components, which I talked about, say network services, 
and all of the components of the security services are all sitting within this layer, right? All converged and sitting together in this layer. And there is going to be an orchestration layer, which essentially manages all communication between all of these components here and this side. Your application and all the workloads, right? Your data, data center and application workloads now are sitting on the other side of the internet edge. So you have the service edge and then there is the internet edge from the SASE where all your data centers would, and workloads would sit. So this is a data center. It could be a connectivity into the data center. It could be over IPsec VPN tunnel or dedicated uh, tunnels. And this is the SaaS services to which the internet edge would have connectivity into. And all of the SaaS, SASE services are essentially, since they are cloud-based, they would be distributed, right? So if the user is sitting in India, in US, in Europe, uh, would be able to connect to the nearest uh, node. Now, talk about the SASE architecture a bit, right? Let's look at a few of the use cases on, on where the SASE architecture would help. The first use case, and before I get, get to this use case, I'll also touch upon a couple of things on the previous slide. Gartner also talks about two modes of SASE. There is an egress SASE, and there is an ingress SASE. So what is an egress SASE? So egress SASE is all of the traffic and controls for your traffic, which is coming from the end users, right? So end users connecting to SASE and that traffic going out either to the data centers, uh, to the SaaS services or out to the internet will go through the uh, filtering at the egress SASE layer. The typical uh, egress SASE components would include uh, your proxy, CASB, firewall as a service, sandboxing, and all of those, right? And the second is the ingress SASE. Now, ingress SASE is essentially for or the security controls that are relevant for traffic coming into your data centers or into your uh, cloud services. And that the, the components within the ingress SASE would include your zero trust network access, it would include your web application firewalls, etc. Right? So that's the difference between ingress and the egress SASE. Now let's go back to the use cases. Right? So the first use case, uh, which is about egress filtering. Yeah? What it means is all of the user traffic that is going out to the internet, uh, to your SaaS services, how do you filter it and have appropriate controls in the traditional architecture and in the SASE architecture? Let's look at the difference. In your traditional architecture, if the users were sitting in the branch offices, all of the traffic would essentially get filtered at this firewall and the traffic would go to the internet and would connect into your SaaS services. And what that would mean is, Essentially, not just your uh, uh, HTTP, HTTPS, which is filtered by the web gateway, all the other traffic would get filtered out and inspected at this layer. Now, in the traditional architecture, if the user is sitting outside and is out on the open internet, uh, the user's internet traffic, which is your 8443 or HTTP, HTTPS traffic may get filtered through your proxy cloud but all the other traffic would be essentially out on the open internet because your proxy is going to filter only 8443. The remaining ports will be out directly on the open internet and there will be no visibility, there will be no control on all of that traffic. So the biggest challenge here is in the traditional architecture that all the remaining ports would not get filtered and you would have no control on those. The second aspect uh, in a traditional architecture, which could also be difficult, is ability to whitelist egress IPs. Right? So if the traffic was coming from uh, the data center, you may have certain uh, ability to kind of whitelist. But if it is coming directly from here, uh, you might want to do uh, the 
proxy whitelisting, but that would be a huge range. You might not, you may not be able to uh, whitelist your non-HTTP HTTP traffic coming into your IS services. So all of that is pretty difficult to do in your traditional architecture. However, within the SASE architecture, it becomes much more easier. So branch office, the end users, remote users, all connecting to your SASE cloud. Now, this is the service edge to which they connect. All of the traffic essentially goes to the SASE cloud. The SASE provider can give you a specific egress IP, it depends on solution to solution. Uh, and that it can address this aspect. But the biggest thing uh, is it, it will address filtering out all of the remaining ports. You would have complete visibility into all of the traffic, irrespective of the traffic coming from branch or coming from users. And the good thing about SASE is you would have a central policy enforcement layer for security. So all of the policy is going to be based on user. If I go back uh, to this architecture, right? There is an identity and access management layer. So that is a critical piece of SASE. So all of the traffic that comes here uh, handle is gets handled by the network. Then it is uh, orchestration layer hands it over to identity access management, where the user and device identity is validated. Based on that validation, there is a common and a consistent enforcement of policy for that user and device, irrespective of whether the user is coming from here or is coming from here. So that is the other benefit that you would get. Uh, you would no more be dependent on a separate set of policies here or a separate set of policies here. It's all a consistent policy, single uh, policy based on user and device context. Right? Uh, quickly cover a couple of other use cases. One is uh, the second use cases uh, on the ingress filtering uh, to your data center and to your applications. Uh, so if the user is connecting uh, to the SASE cloud, the SD-WAN will handle that. First, the user's identity gets validated, then the context by the zero trust agent. And if everything is fine, the, hand, the traffic gets handed over to a firewall as a service or a web application firewall gets filtered and then is uh, further forwarded to your data center and to uh, your servers. The third use case uh, essentially would, your, would be your inter-site connectivity. So if this is the SASE cloud, you have a branch site, maybe there's a new mergers and acquisition that's happening. A new site has to be built up immediately that has connect to your consistent policy layer. You can immediately connect that site over an IPsec tunnel to your SASE. And what that means is you will that site will immediately get the same consistent set of policies uh, based on a user. You want to connect a partner site, you could easily uh, build up that IPsec tunnel into the partner site and have that connectivity come here. All of these locations would then be able to talk to your data centers, to your SaaS services, or would even be able to talk to each other if the policy here allows for it, right? So in summary, uh, what is it that you need to do with the new architecture and with the new uh, scenarios? You need to understand the context uh, of the changes in your environment, right? So is SASE suitable for all organizations? Maybe not. Uh, you have to look at your organization and see if that is suitable. And if it is suitable, do you need to put all of those capabilities or can you do it uh, step by step, right? You, so SASE is not something that you have to take everything at one go and just replace it, right? You can always start building, and that is the recommendation by Gartner also. You start with the base layer and then gradually build on top of it. Right? The second recommendation would be, well, uh, if you do not need to backhaul all traffic, don't do that. Don't backhaul all your traffic to your uh, data center. Because if the user has to access your SaaS services or your cloud over internet, the best way to do that is to let it go over internet, but have the filtering and policy layer on the internet, on the cloud. Enforce zero trust. It is important because if, if all of your workloads are sitting on cloud, you have to create that micro-parent.
that, mentioned about endpoint protection, look at that. Identity access management is critical now, and the context is also going to be critical. And finally, I talked about changes are going to be gradual. So don't expect to change down that whole traditional architecture model one, one place and then suddenly bring in the new SASE architecture. That would not work out. Start with maybe having a networking layer plus firewall as a service on the cloud uh, or a networking capability plus proxy on the cloud and gradually build up the other capabilities such as zero trust, uh, Caspi or other control layers on top of that. So with that, uh, I would close my presentation and would be open to take up questions you may have. So Harshit, do you, you have Neeraj. any yes. questions? Yeah, I haven't got any questions yet. So hello, all. if you have any questions, please do post them in the chat window. I guess there is no questions. Uh, uh, I must say you have explained very well uh, and the presentation was so good that the people have understood each and everything. Though we have already called the time also. So yeah, uh, thank you Neeraj. Uh, I must say it is again very well explained uh, presentation by Neeraj. I'm sure our architecture, architects and head of enterprises attending this webinar uh, has lots of takeaway from, from this session. And we will also upload this presentation on our YouTube channel. Uh, so do visit there. And if you have any questions, you can ask it uh, there in the chat box. So we'll try to get it answered by the speakers uh, in coming time. Yeah. So, right. yeah, thank you all. Thanks for attending this session. And thank you, Neeraj, for your time and this wonderful presentation. Uh, we have our next webinar workshop. Uh, sorry we have our next webinar session on the achilles heel of the threat actor by sham sundar ramaswamy on 26th of feb so hope to see you all there uh, for that webinar thank you thank you Varshat, and thank you to the nalcon team for having me here thank you Niraj. thanks thank you